So are we for moving on with the peers admitted theory? Okay. But I think that's pretty standard everywhere. But our so called undergraduate analysis and Christian Calvin's group. Oh, okay. Prove a time for real. Okay, I think I am ready to start. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully we can reserve this room permanently and not have to deal with that again. So a real quick overview of the course. It's gonna be very simple. Uh, grades are just homework and exams. Uh, in this environment, exams will be take home, open book, open notes. So I'll just give it to you. Go work on it for a few days and do as well as you can. Um, I'm going to follow this textbook pretty closely, uh, Cassell and Berger. If you have a copy of this, great. If you don't, there are PDFs online you can find, so you, you can have something to work out of. Like Just to show how instrumental and, and how important this book has been to me, you can see it, it's falling apart. Like it's, it's barely holding together. Uh, but it's a great book, and I think it'll... I've used it for this class twice before, and I think it'll do well again. And that's the one that's in the syllabus, right? In the textbook? Yes. Yeah. Now, Noah, I know this is your first time taking this course, but you had probability in undergrad? Yeah. Okay, this is basically just, uh, you know, a little bit more grown up probability. Uh, Jed, what's your background in? More applied mathematics. More applied? Yeah. Okay, have you had a probability course? Yeah. Okay, then you should be set to, to jump right into this. It was interesting hearing your conversation about you know, what's applied and what's pure. I didn't intend to go into statistics. Uh, I started grad school wanting to do algebra, and that was my first qualifier exam that I did. And uh, after a while, I got a little bit disenchanted with it because I, I, wanted, I wanted to solve cool problems, and I wasn't really doing that in pure math. And statistics was the last option. There was no way I was going to do stats. But I, liked prob I went into probability, and I liked it, and I didn't realize the connection between probability and statistics. And at the end, I found I had like slowly morphed into doing statistics without ever realizing where it was. Uh, and eventually, I came to think of it like this. Probability and statistics are, are inverse processes of each other. So let me find a better place to put this. I can see it and you a little bit easier. I think that'll work. At what point would you say statistics is not just math? Do you start having a, something that's, I don't know. A lot of times, you know, it's, it's just probability, it seems like, but it's just math. Yeah. Uh, I'd say when you start doing data analysis and you start making decisions that aren't based on anything rigorous anymore, yeah. um, there's one line there. That's a good question. I'd have to think even, even more about an answer to that. Because I realize my thesis is basically just, you know, applied probability theory with some regression involved to the top. So, interesting. All right, so why is this not acting the way it did yesterday? You're supposed to be writing. If I use my, it's moving it around. Okay, I thought I was ready, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, now it's gonna work, cool. Probability and statistics are inverse processes in this way. In probability, what we're gonna do in this course, you start with a model. And usually that model is gonna be indexed by some uh, parameter. Just call it theta in general. And in probability, from that model, it, it produces an event or it produces some data. Maybe there's some random variable that you've observed 
that's based on a probabilistic model. So in, in probability, you're, going, you're starting from the model and then you see what, what events can happen, uh, what, what event could be produced by this model. In statistics, you start with the data, and at least in inferential statistics, you're trying to go the opposite way and learn something about the model that produced it, you're trying to learn something about that, that parameter uh, in particular. So I think of probability as a more deductive, a more logical, and a more rigorous process. You're, you're, you're assuming you know the model, what could come from that. And then statistics is more, more inductive. You're now looking at the data and what can you say with any confidence about the model that produced it. So when I started looking at it this way, I made my peace with statistics. I started to enjoy it more. And uh, if, if you're coming at this from a, a pure background, then maybe that'll help you to enjoy it a little bit more too. So a comment on the notes. I'm following the book very closely. And for the most part, the definitions and theorems, their labels match up with the textbook. There's a few places where the textbook either doesn't include something, or maybe they just have it floating loose in the text, and I think it would be good to have a label attached. Anything that has a C on there, that's just C for Cardin. So this is something that's not technically in the book, but I think it's good to have it here in, in the notes. Uh, let's define a random experiment. An infinitely repeatable procedure something that you could do over and over. With a well-defined set. Of uncertain outcomes. That would probably be easier to see if I cut the light at the front of the room, right? So then the, the, the key components for something to really be a random experiment, I would say, are you need a multiplicity of outcomes. If it's only possible for one thing to happen, then why call it random? That's not a very interesting thing. You require a multiplicity of outcomes. Uh, second, there should be some uncertainty in the outcome. If it's deterministic, then use some other mathematical framework to investigate that. And then the third one, repeatability in an identical fashion. Maybe I'm getting a little philosophical, but I think if there's an event that will only happen once and you can never really think about it repeating, I don't really think it makes sense to assign probabilities to events. What, what will happen will happen. To use you know, the mathematical framework of probability, I think it should be something that at least in theory can be repeated over and over again for the probabilities to make sense. All right, so the first definition, which is actually in the textbook, is out of the sample space. Uh, this textbook uses a capital S. You'll often see a capital omega. In other text, it's the set of all possible outcomes. Of the experiment. Set of all possible outcomes of the experiment, so intuitively, to universe, it's everything that's possible, everything that, that could happen. Most texts uh, will use a lowercase omega to denote one particular outcome at a time. 
So the idea is you've got this experiment, and you, you run it as over and over as many times as you like, and the result is exactly one element of the sample space each time. Get back one and only one outcome. All right, so a uh, couple of simple examples to start with. If the experiment is flipping a fair coin twice, in the sample space, using set notation, Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. And that's it. Have you repeated the experiment? We'll give you one of those, those four things. Now, I've actually made a decision when I chose to represent the sample space that way. Can you think of another very similar but slightly different way that you might choose to, uh, to represent this? Well, here, I've decided that the order matters, right? I'm, I'm thinking of the coins as being in sequence, and so I flip the first one and then the second one. What if I just flip them both simultaneously? Then now I can't differentiate between heads, tails, and tails, heads. So what if I write it this way? Is, th is this wrong? <laughs> I got into an argument with one of my classmates when I took my first probability class. One of us had something like the first one, and the other one had something like the second. And when the professor asking which one is right, he says, well, either one can be right. It's, it's a choice. I mean, there are choices involved in how you express the sample space. Yeah, the first one's probably more better. With the second one, you know, everything's not the same. I agree. With the first one, I've now got equally likely outcomes. And then in the second, I've got to give a higher probability to heads, tails, and the other two. So I think the second one would be harder to work with, but I, I would say neither one is technically wrong. Take an unordered sample without replacement of size two out of a set of objects one, five, and seven. Well, if I'm going to take two objects and it doesn't matter what the order is, I could do one and five. So then I don't need to put 5, 1. I can do 1 and 7. And then I can do 5 and 7. And so these first two examples are uh, discrete. In fact, they're finite. Only got a finite number of outcomes. But we could have something more general, like throwing a dart at a square with uh, corners at the origin and uh, at 1, 1. It's basically just the unit square. Well, now I'd have to use more general set theory notation. I would think it was a set of ordered pairs, x, y, where uh, each of x and y are between 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. Which we'll see in a minute is where things will, will get messy. All right, standard notation, I assume you're familiar with the empty set, the circle with a line through it, the set with no objects in it. So right after defining the sample space, you define uh, an event. An event is a collection of outcomes from the sample space. And the textbook stops their definition there. Just, it's really just a subset, a subset of the sample space. I'm going to add one more thing to this, um, and I'll explain why. The level of probability we're doing is not the very highest level. We're not really doing any measure theory. I'm going to just point and allude to a few things that you would see if you went to the next level up and did a measure theory, measure theoretic treatment of probability. Um, but we won't actually have to really worry about that in this class. So I'm, what I'm going to add to this is that can be assigned a probability. The, the short answer to why we're doing this is if you have an uncountable sample space, it's possible to construct subsets which cannot be assigned a probability in a consistent manner. So 
We don't even try. We don't worry about those. We just let events be things that can be assigned to probability. Uh, and we just work with those. So we say that an event happens or occurs if you run the random experiment and then the outcome is a outcome from that event. So you're already getting the sense that there's a lot of uh, set theory and probability. And my mouse just weirded out, where did the notes go? <laughs> Uh, will, will undo take me back? I've, I've been thrown into this infinite grid of points. Oh, is it just part of the... Is it just that we're working with? All right, so if I, if I randomly choose a, a point in this grid, <laughs> what's the probability I'll actually be able to find my notes? Okay, here they are. <laughs> That would be this is the stupidest way to delay a class I've ever encountered. All right. Uh, weird, weird semester. So uh, I am assuming that you know the, the very basics, uh, unions, intersections, and complements. So I won't actually define those. And I'm not even going to make you write out commutativity. You can intersect or union in whatever order you want. Um, associativity as, as well. I guess the first thing that isn't completely basic would be distributivity, so I'll we'll, we'll actually write that one out. If I intersect A with a union of B and C, uh, I can sort of, it's kind of like it's multiplication and addition. I can uh, distribute out the intersection to B and then union that to having distributed out the intersection to uh, C as well. And then you get the same thing if you just uh, swap intersections and unions. Yeah, uh, that's, that's how I started mine as well, and it's a good place to start. Is there a field of mathematics where set theory is not the basic, most basic thing you build off of? I can't think of one. All right, De Morgan's Laws says uh, complement of a union is the intersection of the complements. And then complement of an intersection is union of the complements. And I think I'd planned on like drawing a picture out on the side of a Venn diagram to illustrate that, but it seems like you're already pretty comfortable with it. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving on. We will use these. We're going to, to cite these in a, in a proof uh, by the end. So the notational use for complement is just kind of like raised to the C? Um, that's what I'm planning, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that must be what the book does if that's what I chose for the notes. Uh, where do you else do you see? The prime? No, I prefer the C. Personally. You see? Prime gets kind of, prime means a lot of things. Yeah. If you changed it in a, in a homework assignment, I wouldn't care. This is, it's not important. All right. Uh, we will need to be able to do operations on infinite collections. So let's say I've got an infinite collection of sets indexed by the natural numbers. So an A1, A2, A3, and so on. I can union those, not just finitely, but uh, an infinite collection of them. And this is going to be all of the outcomes where, well, it's, it's got to be in one of these AIs, just for at least one of them. So I'll say for some I. As long as there's at least one A that it belongs to, it goes into the union. And then the infinite intersection is uh, as restrictive as it could possibly be. That outcome has to be in all of the AI. Is there a significant result to topology 
You know, I have never taken a topology class. I regret that. All right, so here's a little example. If my sample space, my universal set is zero to one, and then my collection AI is from one over I up until one. So let's think about what this would be. Here's a little segment of the number line. A1 is gonna be from one to one. So A1 is just gonna be that much, just the point one. A2 will be from one half to one. A3 will be from uh, one third. And then so on and so on. What's the union of all of those? Okay, so open on the left, not actually including zero, because nothing's ever actually going to get to zero. But I can get as close as I need to. You know, one over a very large number, I can get as close as I need. So everything on the left, all the, almost all the way to zero, gets included. Uh, and then, of course, one is in each of them, so one is definitely there. All right, and how about the intersection of all of them? Yeah, this, that first one is the most restrictive, and everything after that does include it, so just one. So this sequence has an interesting property. Uh, it always includes its predecessors, right? These are getting bigger. Uh, this is the increasing sequence of sets. Uh, if I is contained in J for I being less than J, you're, as you go further on, you're adding more stuff in. It's getting bigger. It's increasing. And so for decreasing, I'm just going to switch the uh, set containment operator around. If AJ is contained in something less than it, in terms of the index, uh, then things are, are shrinking down. So the reason we're interested in sequences that are either increasing or decreasing is for these we can define a limit in a meaningful way. And back in real analysis, you learn how to define limits on, well, real numbers, but limits for sets, that's different. Uh, if a sequence is increasing, we can define the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, the sequence a sub n to be, can you kind of guess what it should be? Increasing. Well, uh, you're on the right track, but you might not have everything in the sample space make it into one of these. But it should be everything that's in any of these. So it'll be the infinite union of them. Okay. If they're... Yeah, so if these are, if, if here's A1, and then A2, and A3, well, you know, maybe there's some ending point, and that's, let's say nothing ever goes beyond that, but eventually everything inside that last circle gets included, that, that's your infinite union. So then if a sequence is decreasing, it'll be the intersection, yeah. And just a note, um, you can have uncountable collections that use some uncountable index set. We're not going to worry about those in this class. I don't think we'll ever need to make use of that. 
Okay, more, more definitions that I think are probably review. Uh, events are disjoint, mutually exclusive. If there, there is no intersection, the intersection is empty. No outcomes, outcomes in common. And then a collection of events will be pairwise disjoint if Yep, I can take any two of them that I want. I pick any two, and then there's, there's nothing in, in their uh, overlap. And so a, a little, little thing to watch out for. Whenever we need this pairwise disjoint property, it's not going to be enough that the intersection of the collection is empty. It's tempting to just look at that and think, oh, well, things are disjoint if I union all of them together and the intersection is empty. But if you think about these three events, one, two, two, three, and one, three, there's nothing that's in all three of them simultaneously. The intersection of the whole collection is empty, but they're not pairwise disjoint. If I pick just any two, I still have a non-empty intersection. All right, next definition, a partition. A collection of events is a partition if... Uh, exactly, make sure they're all disjoint. And then the second part, if I stitch them back together. And I'm just going to use notation for the finite case, or I'm sorry, I actually mean to do the opposite. I'm going to use notation for the infinite case, but it's still true if I put a finite number in place of infinity there. Uh, I union them all and I get back the, the sample space. So the classic Venn diagram for this, if that rectangle is my whole sample space. Then these sets that form the partition. Let me just split it up into pieces that don't overlap. And I, I learned about halfway through my first probability course being good at solving probability problems usually boils down to finding the right way to partition it uh, by using things like the law of total probability, which we will uh, define if you don't remember it. But yeah, just finding the right partition so that this part's easy to find and this part's easy to find and then stitching them back together. Uh, that was usually the right strategy. Okay, remember the power set? It's the set of all subsets. And so the notation I'll use for that is uh, a 2 with a uh, S in the superscript. And you know why we use that notation? Yeah. Um, the order of the power set, the number of subsets, is 2 to however many items there are in the subset. So that's why the notation is, is the way it is. Oh, let's write out one of these. I'm just going to do something small because I... I don't want to write out a whole lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's easy to forget the empty set. Yeah, with only two elements, I'll get back four subsets. Okay, so we're almost at the point where we can stop the set theory review and actually start talking about probabilities a little bit. And, and again, I'm going to take just a moment. I'm going to mention some of the things you have to be concerned about when you deal with this the next level up using measure theory. But then once we you know, realize that there's more to it, we'll just not think about it anymore. Ideally, it seems we should be able to assign a probability to every element of the power set. 
So for every possible collection of outcomes, it'd be nice if you could assign a probability to that. And whenever your sample space is finite or even countably infinite, I don't think there's any problem with that. I think you can. You can assign a probability to every possible subset. But for an uncountably infinite subset, you're under the problems. And I'm just going to mention that I mean, this is the textbook that I worked, learned measure theory out of. If your sample space is the unit interval, there's a simple way of assigning probabilities to every element of the power set that gives you a contradiction. You can show the existence of a subset of the unit interval that has infinite probability. Where, is that yeah. Um, I mean, you can't make sense out of it, so don't even try. So instead of trying to assign probabilities to everything, you're going to restrict your attentions to certain ones which are not going to cause any problems. Uh, curious, have you ever seen the construction of an event like this? It's complicated. It's not easy to produce. You've got to do some tricky stuff. So the uh, way to get around that is we pick a subset of the power set called a sigma algebra, uh, also a Borel field, and we only assign probabilities to that. So let's define what a sigma algebra is. And this part is mostly for your education. I'm not sure. Do you have any homework problems on these? I know I'm not going to ask you any exam questions about them. I don't think so. This is mostly just, just for your education. Uh, you need the empty set in a sigma algebra. If a set A is in the sigma algebra, then its complement should be in. So it's closed under complementation. Complementing. I don't know if that's a real word. And then if I have a collection, which is allowed to be infinite, an infinite collection of events in the sigma algebra, then their union should be as well. So let's think for just a second about what that will give you in the sigma algebra. If you've got the empty set and it's closed under complements, then you've got the whole sample space in it. Um, the third one says that any union that you take, well, what if you want intersections? Well, what happens if you take the complement of, of a union? You're going to get by de Morgan's laws. Wherever it is, yeah, here it is. Uh, you complement those unions and you get back intersections. And so you can get anything that can be formed by infinite intersections or unions or any sort of complement, all of those are going to be in the sigma algebra. So it's very broad. It, it tends to be a very broad, comprehensive collection of sets. And, you know, for every practical purpose I've ever encountered, that's enough. So you just assign probabilities to these things. If it's not in sigma algebra, it doesn't matter. It's so weird and abstract, you're never going to find it. And that is all we're going to say about that. Here's a summary. The sigma algebra, it's a subset of the power set where you can assign probabilities in a non-problematic way. So finally, we can now give our, our three axioms of probability. Given a sample space and an associated sigma algebra, a probability function, uh, P, is a function from the sigma algebra, so inputs are events that are in the sigma algebra, to the uh, unit interval, 0, 1, satisfying Probabilities are non-negative, smallest they can be is zero. Probability of the entire sample space, remember the sample space will always be in the sigma algebra, 
as always, one. And then the third axiom. If I have an infinite collection of pairwise disjoint events, then the probability of their union Remember this one, what does it have to be? Well, uh, these don't necessarily have to union to the sample space. Well, um, no, because it's possible. What if it's after some point, these events in the collection are empty? So you could have, this really could be a finite collection, and you just force it to be infinite by putting the empty set uh, an infinite number of times afterwards. If they're disjoint, then the probability of the union is the sum of the probabilities. If events are disjoint, no overlap, the probability of their union is the sum of the individual probabilities. And that is all that it takes to, uh, to build probability theory. It all just comes from those three, three axioms. Now, there's a lot of other things that you know are true about probability, uh, and they're all derived from this. Like, it doesn't actually say that the probability event has to be less than one, but you, you can get that from, from two, and do you have to use three for that one? Well. I don't remember, but we'll remind ourselves soon because I know that's a homework problem. All right, so uh, how much time do we have? Okay, yeah, we should be good. So anything that satisfies these three axioms is technically a probability function, but for it to be meaningful, like how do we interpret a probability? What, what, what is a probability? So what should that function uh, represent? I think if it's going to agree with our intuition about what probabilities are, it should represent the stabilization of long-term frequencies. I remember as a master's student, there were some problems that I couldn't make sense of and they seemed kind of paradoxical. I'll mention one in just a minute, and it, I finally resolved it when I realized I should think of a probability as how the relative frequency is going to settle down. So if, if A is an event, and I've got a probability P of A for it. Well, let me repeat the experiment and see how often I get an outcome out of A. If N sub K is the number of times that outcome occurs out of K repetitions, then, well, take a proportion. How often have I seen the event A out of how many trials I've done? And if I take a limit, that's what the probability of A should represent. Um, now, I, I should mention, this is not a definition. This is actually something that's derived. Uh, this is a consequence of the axioms. Uh, in chapter five, when we prove the law of large numbers, it's gonna be probably the last week of class, uh, we'll find this is a derived statement, something that's proved. Let me mention one of those paradoxical things. Uh, let's say that my sample space is all the numbers in the unit interval from zero to one got an uncountable number of outcomes here. So what does the probability of any particular outcome have to be? So let me just pick something. Yeah, so square root of two over two. That's in the unit interval, right? Okay, so it's, it's in here somewhere, I don't know. It's a number. What's the probability if I randomly select a number from zero to one, I'm gonna get this number? It's zero. Probability of any individual one outcome is gonna be zero, all right? Well, run the experiment and you get a number. But the probability of getting that number was zero, but it happened. So, so does a probability being zero mean something is impossible? I thought it, I thought it should. It finally made sense when I realized 
yeah, if, if I run this experiment a million times, am I ever going to see that number again? Probably not. And even if I do, this proportion here is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So I realized, ah, events with probability zero doesn't mean impossible. It means in the long run, the proportion of times I'll see them is zero. That makes sense? I think so. I, uh, I believe. I mean, those are, you know, those are different kinds of affinities, so that might be a different kind of zero in terms of the probability. Yeah, and, and again, we're getting into questions that can be answered better if you take the measure theoretic approach. I mean, if you think about it, you know, think about the lottery. You know, you have how many people play it. I mean, that's probably, well, it's not even infinite. It's discrete. But your probability is really close to zero. I mean. Yeah. I mean, it's not that's, but it's probably not small at all. It's just small. Yeah. In terms of math, it's not that small. That wasn't the call, by the way. That picture on the book. <laughs> all right. So finally, we can define a probability space, and it's three things. Uh, you need the sample space, the collection of outcomes. You need the sigma algebra. You need a collection of subsets that it's okay to assign probabilities for. And we're not really going to worry about that part much ourselves. And then you need a probability function, something that actually uh, defines the probabilities. So, um, you know, let's build one. Let's build a probability space. We're going to go back to that experiment of an unordered sample without replacement of size 2 out of a set of three values, 1, 5, and 7. And we'll assume that we have uh, equal selection probability for each of, of these numbers. So I've already got the first thing I need. Here's my, actually, this is not my sample space, but we wrote that on the second page. What I need to do now is I need to build the uh, sigma algebra. I need to look at all possible subsets of the sample space. So if it's going to be a sigma algebra, remember the first requirement? You do have to include the empty set. And then I'm going to include uh, three sets that only have one outcome in them. So you have to remember an outcome is a selection of two things. So I don't really have two outcomes here. I just have one. Uh, here's another set with only a single outcome in it. And then I'm going to put in the events that have two outcomes. And then finally, well, if I include all three of the uh, outcomes, I've, I've got everything. I've got the whole sample space. So I'll just write S for that. Okay, so I've got my sample space. I've got my sigma algebra. The next thing I need to do is uh, build my probability function. So the axioms of probability tell me what Actually, it's not directly in the axioms. Well, the probability of but, S is 1, so the confidence is going to be 0. Right? Yeah, this one is definitely uh, given directly by the axioms. The first one is not, but it can be derived quickly from the axioms. And then, uh, because we assume that we've got equal selection probability, I can assign 1 third to each of these. And so there we have it. There's a uh, simple probability space. All right, uh, questions on that so far? Okay, 
So what I did next is uh, there's a lot of properties that can be derived pretty quickly. And the book kind of splits them up into a few different theorems. I've just combined them all into one long theorem. So let's, let's state these. P is a probability function. A and B are any sets. And then the C's are going to be a collection that form a partition of the sample space. Just a moment ago, I heard Noah say this, uh, probability of the complement is one minus the probability of the original event. The axioms give a lower bound on a probability. You can then derive an upper bound. And once you have A proved and you combine that with the first axiom, then you get the probability of the empty set is zero. All right, go to the next page. Uh, D. Is that called a set difference? I was thinking earlier there's a name for it, and that's, that's the best that I could remember. Some sort of takeaway operator or something? Yeah. I'm using minus signs instead. That, that gives us some answer. Yeah, I don't really like using arithmetic operators on things that aren't numbers. I'd rather have a different uh, symbol. Anyway, what it means is it's the stuff in B that's not in A. So that's a, a definition of it. And then uh, what the theorem says is, well, you can take the probability of B, but then if anything is in A and B, you'll want to subtract that away to get the probability of just B and not A. And it seems like you're familiar with those concepts, but just in case you like a picture, uh, this would be the stuff over here. All right, E. This is what I'm going to teach my undergrads in a couple months as the general addition rule. Yeah, the first part's more, I do generating data first, then descriptive statistics, and then we don't really do probability until the middle of the class. Yeah, when they come to tutoring and they have a question about, how do I put this in my PIA before I start doing this? <laughs> and I'll give an answer. Yeah, you know. All right, and, uh, you know, I like the Venn diagrams for these, so I'm going to draw it. This one makes a lot of sense. I want the probability of the union. Well, I'll get the probability of the first one, and I'll get the probability of the second one. Ah, crap, I just shaded the middle part twice. I better correct by subtracting that away. And in homework, you'll give a more uh, rigorous demonstration. F is one of my favorites, the law of total probability. And we're going to see the law of total probability in a few different forms over these next... Uh, few lectures. Remember that the C's form a partition. So if I draw my Venn diagram, I can split up the whole sample space according to the C's. And then if there's some A, and how A interacts with the C's is not really important, I'll just draw an A right here. Well, I can break up A according to how it intersects with the C's. So A doesn't act, intersect with C1 at all. That would be the empty set. But I do get a non-empty intersection with C2 and then with C3. And so I can combine A back together by seeing how it interacts with the C's. All right, and then the last part of this theorem if A is a subset of B, then the probability of A must be less than or equal to 
probability of B. So I'd say really the main part of your homework is, uh, I mean, you, you'll prove all parts of that. So from the axioms, from the very first notions, prove every part of that. And do them in that order. Uh, you can only use the axioms or other properties which you have already proved. So you can't, a lot of these things, they just feel true. They, they feel very intuitive. But I, I want you to figure out exactly how you uh, know that for certain. All right, got 15 minutes. Let's state and prove this uh, last theorem, which is something we'll need when we start doing limit theory, which is mostly going to be at the end of the semester. Continuity theorem. If I've got a sequence of events, if that sequence is increasing, then we can define the limit of the probabilities. And it will be equal to the probability of the limit of the sets. So these are, are similar looking statements, but on the left I've got the limit on the outside. So I'm looking at a limit of real numbers. And then on the right, my limit's on the inside. So I'm looking at the probability of a, of a limit of sets. And then if the sequence is decreasing, the statement's exactly the same. So the statement really just needs one of those two conditions. You either need it to be increasing or decreasing. And so the way I, I think of this theorem, it's telling me when I can interchange a limit and a probability. Limits and probs can be interchanged for, why don't I group those together into one heading for monotonic series of sets, either increasing or decreasing. And I just realized right now, have you seen the monotone convergence theorem in an analysis class? Uh, yeah, I've seen it, but remembering it's a different letter. Yeah, uh, but that's, that allows you to interchange limits and integrals, right? It's, uh, I think it... <laughs> okay. Well, I'm working off, the, off my memory. I think this is true. I believe that allows you to exchange... A lot of times they'll say exchange derivatives and integrals, but a derivative is really defined by a limit, so it lets you interchange limits and integrals. Well, when you go to the measure theoretic version of probability, a probability is usually an integral, so I think I just realized these are more related than, than I had thought. Uh, so anyway, let's prove this, and this, will be, this one will be a little bit tricky. Here's the overall goal. I want to be able to use uh, disjointness and the third axiom. But if I have a sequence that's increasing or decreasing, it's clearly not going to be disjoint, right? If I've got set containment, I'm not even close. But I'm going to set things up in an equivalent way which does use disjointness. So we're just going to prove part A um, for increasing sets. So I'm going to define a set B1, which is equal to A1. I'm going to define B2, which is the set difference between A2 and A1. And then B3 is going to be the set difference between A3 and A2. And it's going to go like that. So let me come out on the margin. What I'm doing is, uh, let's see, I've got the increasing sequence right now. So A1 is the smallest. Well, I'm just going to let A1 and B1 be the same thing. And then the stuff out here, 
that gets added on, that's going to be B2. It's just the new stuff that wasn't in A1. And then I'm going to go out again, and then this new stuff will be B3. Now they're disjoint, right? Now the, the Bs are going to be disjoint. So... And you hear what, what word? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you think he was right? No. I suspect he wasn't either. I don't think so. I'm not super familiar with that problem, but I remember reading that there is a technique that seems like it's right, but there's a subtle flaw in it, and they think that maybe he discovered that. He's like, oh, yeah, I got this, and he never did. It could be like me sometimes. I think I proved it, but I proved it for one case. <laughs> okay, um, so we've, we've figured out these, are pair, these Bs are pairwise disjoint. The next thing to note, because the A's are increasing, I think it's pretty clear that if you union them, you're just going to get the last one because it's going to contain all the stuff before it anyway. And then if you union the B's together, you're going to arrive at exactly the same place, right? It's like this whole thing is A3. Union A1, A2, A3, you've got A3. Union B1, B2, and B3, well, this time they were disjoint, but you still get the same thing. Okay, so uh, the last thing that we have to note before we can move on. So if I look at the sum of the probabilities of the Bs up until N, I mean, I can, I can tell from the picture, this is going to be the probability of An because it's going to add, you know, the inner part and the next part and the next part, and it's going to reach that A. But we've got to use our axioms and prove it uh, rigorously. So in my first step, I use the definition of the Bs. Every B is a set difference of an A and the one that came before it. So it's, uh, you know, the donut part. And then the theorem that's above, at the very top of the page, it gives us an expression for a set difference. So I'm just carrying along the sum. So I'm using uh, the theorem part D to get that equality. But then I can simplify that second term because the A's are increasing. If I intersect AI with the A that came before it, well, I'm just going to get the smaller of the two. Okay, do you agree with all of those? Okay. So then, what do I have here? You've probably seen series that are like this. There's a name for it. That's a telescoping, telescoping series. So, uh, Jed, can you see what's going to happen when I add up all of these differences? I'm going to have an... Well, I don't want to convert it back to the B's. I do want to keep it in terms of the A's. Mm -hmm. But if I actually wrote it out, it would look like this, right? Well, 
here's a positive A1 with a negative A1, positive A2 with a negative A2. And I, I never really defined an A0, so let's define A0 to be the empty set, so which have probability zero, won't actually change anything. Well, it's got a probability zero, so I can just ignore that anyway. The only thing that gets left is the AN. So I just get the probability of A sub N, which is what we thought we were gonna get the whole time. We were expecting to get the probability of A sub N, and, and there it is. Okay, so we can now do one more step and finish the proof. Then, if I start with the left-hand side of my assertion, we just showed the probability of A in is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the Bs up until n. So I'll substitute in. Okay, and then now I can use my third axiom of probability, the one that says if I have a disjoint uh, union, that's equal to the sum of the probabilities. The A's weren't disjoint, but the B's are. So this is now Okay, yeah, I've moved my limit and the infinity inside probability. But then, well, a unioning the Bs, isn't that going to give you the same thing as unioning the As? It will. And an infinite union of an increasing series is exactly how we defined the limit of an increasing set. And there we have it. Whew. Work up a sweat with that one. And if we wanted to prove part B, we would not need to do it from scratch. follows from part A, which we did prove, uh, distributivity and De Morgan's. All right, questions about any part of that? Can you have the limit of P of A n equals the limit of the sums of P of B i? Is that because we're just taking that, uh, what is it, the second also? Do it for this, to say that that's, does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, so it was written with a finite index, mm -hmm. and then we wrote it down here with the infinite index. Yes. Yeah, so on, on each one of these, I could, um, I could put a limit on each one of those. And then with the, the limit is the infinite union. And so then I can just use that notation down here. All right, I know that normally when I teach the class, everybody's like, oh, easy set theory review. And then we do this one, and they, their eyes glaze over. So we're okay? No. All right. You got a two o'clock class? Yeah. All right. You're fine, we're about to leave. All right, so uh, I will let you know that because this is a foundational class for the whole probability statistics track, I am gonna give you more homework in this than a normal class. So uh, Noah, you won't get nearly as much in stochastics as you will in here. Um, yeah, the, the, the concepts are harder, so I give a lighter load work workload to uh, balance that out. So you got four problems, 
and I bet you'll do, I bet you'll do the first three okay, it's that fourth one. There's something really hard about proving things that just seem obvious, but um, I mean, give it a try. My office is right down the hall. Uh, you can send me an email at any point, and we'll try to set up a Zoom meeting if we need to or something. Yeah, let's uh, have a due date of, of one week out, which will be the 25th. Eight twenty-five.